I was uh, conscious this morning, especially in between services before the first service and so forth, um, of and appreciative of how many of you have, over the last uh, three or four months, uh, carried me in your prayers. And um, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, those of you who are not here this fall, I was diagnosed with uh, an illness, a malady called, uh, said CIDP. You can look it up. Um, and that's all I'd encourage you to do because you really don't want to read everything that's there. But anyway, uh, thank you for all that. This last week, I finished the first round of three treatments, and we'll see where it goes and, and, and so forth. But some of you have asked what problems it causes. And without uh, going too, too much in depth, I, what, one of the frustrations is, is uh, my stepping yeah, you know, stepping is a conscious effort for me at times. My balance and my ability to negotiate with my feet. Because when you have some form of neuropathy, you lose contact with your feet. And so instead of your brain just saying step, you have to think about it. And it becomes a little more precarious at times. But it becomes no more precarious than, and I'm just thinking, how does that relate? It, it becomes no more precarious than experience that most of us have probably had, one way or another, here, living on the beach. Because all of us, I would suspect at least a high percentage of all of us here, have had to negotiate the distance between the boat and the dock. Right? Or even being on the boat at, at some point in time. We live and we are associated in so many ways with, with water. And, you know, water can be very precarious because you think you're there and then somebody speeds by and then the boat does this. Or you pull up to the dock and, you know, the boat's there the, and it goes up and down or bumps into it or backs off of it depending on uh, the waves and the weather and the skill of the captain at the time. <laughs> you know, some of them crash in a little more than others. There's reasons they put those old tires there. But you, you, you get it. I mean, you know, you know what that can be like to try to negotiate it. Well, taking it one step further, it seemed that it might even be applicable to our Scripture this morning and through the Epiphany season because... We know what it's like to have to negotiate that step. We know what it's like to feel out of balance, seeking firm ground, new ground, and the disciples the same way. After all, what were most of the disciples? Fishermen, fisher people, right? And so they were out on the lake, which is the Sea of Galilee is very big. And the winds come up very quickly and the waves can get very large. So Jesus is calling these disciples and he is more than likely calling them in, in many instances from a fishing setting. And fishing probably not on a bridge. There is no bridge there. Not on a rock, more than likely, but from out in a boat. And we have, as I said last week, we have this mental image somewhere we got it in church school or somewhere that when Jesus called, they just immediately responded. They had this aha experience. They jumped out, were fully committed and raw. How deep it is and if my feet are going to touch the ground. Especially with my swimming skills. And I'm also thinking about what's in there that I can't see. Do I get an amen here or I, am I the only one? Okay. Okay, so we're on the same thought pattern. So my point is that no matter what their response to the call, I think there is probably more care involved than we think. There is more caution. There is more of a stepping process than... We admit. You know, there's a story always about ministers, three ministers, they're out fishing, and one says, I, I'm hungry. 
And so, you know, they're out in the middle of the lake, whoever steps out, walks in the water and goes in to look at each other. Half hour later, the other minister says, well, you know, I have to relieve myself. So he steps out and he goes in. The third minister of a denomination not to be mentioned says, well, if they can do it, certainly I can, steps out and goes into the water. And the other two on shore look at each other and they say, well, should we tell him where the rocks are? (laughs) You see, there is, few of us would just jump. And I would say the disciples did it with caution and care as well. It's interesting, if you read the Gospels with a clear and precise mind, it's interesting how honest the Gospel writers are with the personalities and the characters of those involved, especially the disciples, especially the Gospel of Mark, where they are often portrayed as these people who are next to Jesus and see the healings, the helping, hear the message, and yet, very often, they just don't get it. In fact, many times, Jesus has to turn to them and say, do you not understand yet? And probably the clearest example of this comes in the last few verses of the Gospel of Matthew where they've been through, and if you read Matthew, you go from from, uh, the birth and the star to the the Beatitudes to the ministry in Galilee, the healing, the miracles to the crucifixion, death, resurrection. You go through the whole story, and Matthew at the very end says at the ascension, and still some doubted. Very, very human in this regard. The point? The point is that discipleship, this following of Christ, for most of us, and I would say the highest percentage of us, is probably not an instantaneous, clear, yahoo, jump in the water, walk to shore response but that for most of us, including the original disciples, probably was a gradual progression. A gradual progression wherein they decided they would partner with God, move ahead, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, many times falling back. Discipleship takes time. It takes commitment. It requires a willingness to see life from an alternative perspective. And that is far more difficult than anything. Discipleship is, by definition, discipline. Step by step. So I ask myself, what would be some of the few, if I were to consider this and implement this and make a resolution in my life and and get serious about this, what would be some of the steps that I would recommend or I would need to take, and I do need to take them continually? What are some of the steps involved in this discipleship discipline thing? Let me offer you three. The first step you have to take if you're going to be a disciple or a follower of Christ is you have to be willing to step away from who you are now. You have to step away. You have to step out of what you have become to fully become what God would have you become or intends you to become. You following me? You cannot reach a point of satisfaction that says, I have made it. It's a done deal. I'm pretty good, God. Just leave me here. You have to step away from that. And that is very hard. It's comfortable being where we are. And it's, and it's comfortable to seek to surround us with beliefs and with people that keep us where we are. And yet discipleship calls you away from that point. I will make you fishers of men. But it doesn't happen if you quit, don't quit being fishers of fish. You can't sail a boat if you cling to the shore. You can't travel to new lands by simply Googling Paris. Well, you can get a ticket, but, you know, that's not the same. And you can't gain new knowledge by reading the same old books or listening to this, the age-old voices. You know, we all have baggage, we all have past experiences, we all have prejudices. 
they're a struggle. Christ says, come. You know, sometimes over the years, I've preached sermons that really felt like they hit the spot. They felt good, and, and the response seemed that way. And people would say later on, well, you can use that one again. You know, the truth is you can't. Not because it didn't contain truths or even a message that could be applicable eternally. Not because those things aren't consistently there if we look for them. But because we're different. The world is different. The situation is different. And all of a sudden, it's just not as relevant as, as it was. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't fit. And you look at it and you say, I said that? You know, someone said to me once, the problem with church people is that they come to church expecting to be moved and then they all sit in the same place. <laughs> Do I hear an amen to that? <laughs> okay. And if you don't believe me, just come to a church as a visitor and sit in somebody's place who has sat there for a while. You would think the walls were coming down. Truth. Step away. Secondly, you have to step up. You have to step up and be counted. And, and you know, we're kind of, we, we kind of like to stay in the closet with that part of us. Because, you know, I can step away and I can work on these things privately, but to step up means that sometimes you step alone. That sometimes you don't fit in. That sometimes what the world is saying or the course of the world is very different. And when you step out of it, oh, that's a scary place. I remember an athlete one time who was going to a championship game. And the city was scared that the team might lose again. And he, he said, well, you know, you can't hit a home run if you don't take every opportunity you have to step up and try. You know, you have to will, willingly take a chance at risking it, being alone, because, you know, you, you can't be the hero if you aren't risking being the fool. There is that need, there is that desire when you are called to be counted and accountable. So many Christians, and so easily as Christians, we can profess our faith. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that. And yet, we're afraid to act on it, or in some cases, publicly own it. Do you remember the story of Jesus multiplying the fish and the loaves? Remember that? One, one gospel, it's 3,000. Another gospel, it's 5,000. The disciples' response, true to form, Jesus says, well, we've got to feed these people. It's lunchtime. He looked on them with compassion, the text says. They're hungry. What do you have? They said, five, five loaves, three fish, send them home. It's not enough. Oh, ye of little faith. Jesus says, give it to me. I'll take what you give. Take what you give. Fed them all, and the story ends by saying they had lots left over. That when you step away and you step up, there is an abundance that happens when we partner and we risk and we trust and we have faith in God. That there is actually leftovers. And who here, after Thanksgiving, doesn't relish a hot turkey sandwich with gravy all over it? Don't you love it? Yeah. I'm getting lots of amens today. The leftovers are as good and sometimes taste better than the original leftovers. You know, one of, the, one of the challenges, truly one of the challenges, honestly, this church has is that our ministry has been far more successful than our support of it financially. And, you know, it's a point as we move into the future. We need to step up if we're going to succeed. But when we step up, when we risk sharing, and when we're about caring, the more we do, the more blessings, it says, come back to us, more blessings in ways we cannot imagine or possibly personally design. Step away, step up, and the third one, 
The third one is not really about us. It's about God. Because when you step away, when you open yourself up, when you become vulnerable, vulnerable and receptive, and you're willing to own that, then all of a sudden doors and windows open and God can step in. And that's when things really happen. That's when there's change. But we don't like that because that's scary stuff. I mean, it really is scary stuff. This is the last week I'll mention it, but the Tebow phenomena. And I'm, I'm serious about this because, as I said in my Chris, Christmas letter, you know, everybody makes a lot of it. You know, is God for you? Is God against you? Does God care if the Broncos win? Does God care if the page? I mean, who cares? I mean, I really think God has better things to do than that. But the interesting phenomena that's worth mentioning here is how uncomfortable how uncomfortable people and our culture seems to be when, when God is inserted in any way in front of us. You, you know, you can agree with this theology, you can disagree with this theology, that's not the point. The point is how people just kind of bristle at someone who would stand in that position. Whether it's him, whether it's us, whether it's other, you see, it is scary to us to let God in. And people think they have, but I submit to you that when we bristle about these subjects that maybe it's not happening the way we think it should. Jesus steps into the water. Jesus is baptized. Jesus comes up out of the water, and it is then that the Holy Spirit descends upon him. It is then, as he steps in, steps out, the Holy Spirit comes down and God steps in to him. Which doesn't eliminate the troubles or the challenges. Read the rest of the story. But what it does do is it enables him to overcome them. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We look for God to get rid of it all. We look for God to defeat all our enemies. Jesus says what God helps us to do is overcome. God steps in and we overcome. My treatment. I do not get chemotherapy. I get infusions. I get infusions of byproducts of blood. Which doesn't cure the issue I struggle with. What it does is it helps my body to overcome those things that would bring me down. When God steps into your life, the same happens. And you discover it's enough. When we truly step in line with Christ, that's what happens. When we get out of the boat and we move there, we have times we stumble, we have times we will fall, we have times we will make mistakes. The Gospels are very clear with that. But the Gospels are not about the results today. The Gospels are about the end results. The end results. And in those, God wins. And so do we. So when we step in line with Christ, that's what happens. God protects, God strengthens, God guides. The path that we get on of discipleship may not always be straight. It may be convoluted. It may be crooked. We may veer off at some times. We may go away, come back. The journey of a thousand miles, though, begins with one step. Step by step. So dare to take it. Dare to take that step. Dare to believe in the direction that step would lead you. Trust on it. Depend on it. Know that at this time, not just at some ancient time, but at this time, this moment, Christ is calling you. Christ is calling you. And the boat looks pretty good.
What do you do? What will you do? Amen. At this time,